In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Last Sunday, we spoke a little bit about our first Pope, St. Peter, and this morning's epistle comes from his hand. So he wrote this epistle while he was dealing with some very serious issues in the nation church. There was a lot of false testimony being brought against the Christians, and so he tells the faithful in this letter not to let the hardships of these persecutions damper or stifle the good example that they were trying to give. He tells them not to return evil for evil, and the opening statement of this epistle is a summary of Christian virtues. Be like-minded, be charitable, and be humble. This may seem that the message is being oversimplified, but it was really the example of the early Christians that brought about so many conversions in the early days of the church. And so St. Peter says that the suffering that the early Christians are undergoing is going to make them more and more in the image of our Lord. And so our Lord begins this gospel discourse with the commandment, thou shalt not kill, because the breaking of this commandment is principally against the love of one's neighbor. He limits himself to pointing out that it does not merely command us not to take life, but also not to relish interior anger and its exterior manifestations. So he develops this teaching in this gospel according to some of the legal practices of the Jewish people of the time. In the Jewish legal system in the ancient world, there were three tribunals. The first consisted of three judges, and they dealt with minor offenses against the law. The second court consisted of 23 judges, and they dealt with crimes, and they had the power to impose the death penalty. And finally, there was the Grand Sanhedrin, consisting of 72 members, and this was the authority which dealt with religious offenses. So the three offenses mentioned by our Lord, are, first of all, are interior anger against one's neighbor, and then the exterior results of that, and Relig- uh, insults in word, and then the possibility of religious offenses. So in this passage, our Lord is teaching us not to give way to anger or to exterior sins of the tongue against one's neighbor. Anger tends to destroy God's image in us, which is essentially one of peace and harmony. Anger can blind one's intelligence, and it can lead to such sins as hatred and murder. You'll notice that serious crimes are often committed at night, including murders. And echoing the thoughts of St. Peter, in another letter, St. Paul expresses it best when he says, do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Why would he make this type of statement? During the day, there are many things which distract us and seek our attention. But at night, when we find ourselves alone and retiring from the day, Our thoughts can end up reflecting upon the events that happened and perhaps injuries committed against us, whether in word or deed, something that we have received from someone. And these ideas and thoughts can be thrown upon us like waves and they grow larger and larger and the storm of revenge increases. So just as a wise doctor prescribes not merely preventative medicine but also those which cure, Christ does both things here. He forbids us, for example, to call someone a fool or other terms expressed in the heat of anger, and he gives us a remedy which prevents enmities from arising. By commanding that one be reconciled to one's brother, he gives a curative remedy for evils which can follow upon enmity. There is nothing which does more to destroy our life than long delays in doing good. It is this which causes us to lose everything more often than not. Now what virtue, which seems so simple and yet so unattainable, seems to be part of the remedy to so much trouble that we get ourselves into? If we really think about it, a virtue that can help maintain strong marriages, good friendships, and general stability of life 
is the virtue of patience. It is a virtue that the author of this sermon often finds himself lacking in. (laughs) But, But patience has God as its author. And from God proceed its dignity and its glory. Men should love this thing which is dear to God. Patience is a good which the divine majesty loves and one that he commands. If God is our Lord and our Father, let us imitate his patience, because it is fitting that servants should be obedient. Now, one might say, this is a softball sermon. Patience is easy, but hold your horses. How great is the patience of God. Revenge is in the power of God, and the Holy Scriptures show the wrath of God time and time again. You know, we forget that he does have a wrath. Revenge is in his power, but he prefers to be patient for a very long time, and he bears with us mercifully, and he puts off his wrath, so that if it be possible, the long protracted evil may at some time cease And man who may be plunged into the contagion of error and sins may, even though late, be converted to God. He tells us in the book of Ezekiel, Why do you choose death, O men of Israel? Come back to me and live. And through the prophet Joel, he says, Come back to the Lord your God. He is ever gracious and merciful, ever patient and rich in pardon, and even now he is ready to forgive. Referring to this, St. Paul says, Is it that you are presuming on that abundant kindness of his, which bears with you and waits for you? Do you not know that God's kindness is inviting you to repent? Now, not only did our Lord teach this virtue in words, but he also fulfilled it by his deeds. He said he came down from heaven to do the will of his Father. Among the wonderful virtues he displayed, he maintained the patience of his father in his endurance. All of the actions of our Lord from his very birth are characterized by patience. Coming down from heaven, the Son of God did not scorn to take on himself the flesh of man, and although he himself was not a sinner, he bore the sins of others. He allows himself to become mortal so that the guiltless himself may be put to death for the guilty's salvation. We see our Lord baptized by John the Baptist, and he, Christ, who is about to grant the remission of sins, does not disdain to wash in the waters of regeneration. Our Lord could bear Judas Iscariot to the very end with long-suffering patience, and he could even eat a meal with his enemy. And he knew the foe in his household, and he did not point him out openly nor refuse the traitor's kiss. How often we see Christ turning the unbeliever to the truth of the faith by gentle persuasion, answering calmly those who contradicted him, bearing with the proud and mercy, and yielding with humility to his persecutors, wishing always to gather together the killers of the prophets and those who had been rebellious against God, even to the very last hour of his cross and passion. How many times in history we have seen the adversaries of God, blasphemers, those who were enemies of his very name, be given the grace of repentance if they would repent of the crimes they committed, and he not only pardons them for their sins, but they are granted the reward of the heavenly kingdom. That's the patience of God at work. Patience, which commends us to God, keeps us united with him. What, is, what are the, some, of the, some of the things that patients can do? Patients can save lives. Many times, if you've done or know friends who have done sidewalk counseling um, for someone who's contemplating an abortion, you know, the virtue they're often lacking, the person who's contemplating an abortion, is patience. They got themselves into the situation And you talk to them and you say, well, what's going on? And they say, I don't have time to be pregnant. I can't have this in my life right now. Patience. It's a a life that's at stake. Patience calms anger. It bridles the tongue. It governs the mind. It guards peace. 
It rules over discipline. It breaks the force of lust. It represses the violence of pride, extinguishes the fire of enmity. It checks the power of riches. It eases the needs of the poor. It makes men humble in adversity, brave in time of sorrow, and gentle towards wrongs and insults. I guarantee you, you're going to see me lose my patience today because I preached this sermon. Something's going to happen, and my Irish is going to get up, and I'm just going to completely blow it. Physician, heal thyself. Patience teaches us to pardon those who wrong us. It helps us to resist temptation, to suffer persecution, and it perfects martyrs. It is patience, aided by divine grace, which fortifies firmly the very foundations of our faith. May God grant us all patience. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.